Welcome to Podheim, Jirok's Valheim podcast. Let's give him the business. Hey, everybody. Today is February 9th, 2022. I'm your host, Jirok the Viking, and joining me today are my fellow Vikings, Gwen the Shield Maiden. Hello. Viking Rudy, Rudistic the Guardian. Skull Vikings. And Viking Thorin, a.k.a. Metarune. Hey, everyone. Have you ever tried to switch to your hammer while you're targeting an item stand? I bet you were surprised when that item stand gave you the business and stole your hammer. Well, we're going to give you the business today, too. And if you're not careful, Thorin might even try to steal your hammer to add to his collection, won't you, Thorin? You know I will. I was waiting for the darn tootins. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm disappointed. I can do it again. I know. Gwen was so <laughs> or I excited. I can add more to it. Uh, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll do it just for fun. Uh, and if you're not careful, Thorn might even try to steal your hammer to add to his collection. Won't you, Thorn? Darn tootins, you know I will. I've lost <laughs> many a hammer to those item stands. <laughs> so uh i just wanted to start with a little casual chat before we get into everything i wanted to see how everyone was doing over the last week i know i was super busy and didn't get to chat with many of you uh and wondering if anything exciting happened over the weekend anybody feel like sharing yeah i can go um i took a drive up to the, our local uh ski hill uh, with a uh, cousin and uh, her husband and my wife. And yeah, we all got out uh, skiing and snowboarding for a couple days. Um, the snow wasn't the best, but it was nice and sunny out at least. So uh, yeah, first time out this year, it was good to good to get out. Oh, nice. And uh, I'm guessing um, everybody was safe and had fun. Yep. No injuries. Uh, got to take my new truck on a on a road trip for the first time. So that was fun too. Oh, nice! Yeah, new 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 vehicles are always exciting. Are you like super super careful with where you park and everything to make sure that there no nobody dings it or scratches it? <laughs> uh, I'm not as worried about the truck long term, but yeah, since it's new, I'm being more careful with it, and it's big enough that I'm kind of <laughs> avoiding parking anywhere if I can. Uh, <laughs> I'm usually on the far side of the parking lot. That's for sure. Yeah, I, I see uh, a lot of people when they get a new vehicle, especially if it's a bigger vehicle, they'll park far away in the parking lot from everyone, or they'll take up two spots by parking in the middle. Have you done I'm that? I'm not that too? bad. Oh, okay. No, <laughs> I'm not that guy. And Rudy, uh, how about you? I know you were feeling a little under the weather. How was your last week and weekend? Yeah, well, uh, I was pretty quiet on the podcast last week for for good reason. I uh, I did get the COVID bug, but. Uh, yeah, I'm feeling a lot better today, testing negative now, and I can taste and smell things, and the world is good again. So uh, just spent the weekend resting up and uh, feeling great now and ready to take the bull by the horns. Uh, that's Glad that's great. Hear that. Yeah. I know when, when I lost my uh, taste and smell, that was, you know, besides feeling just absolutely miserable, um, you know, I would treat myself to a strong drink or you know, maybe some, um, you know, comfort food, but when you can't taste or smell, not even that helps you feel better. It was pretty funny. I, uh, it was yesterday I made a uh, microwave dinner and I was eating and I just turned to my wife. I'm like, this is gross. Like, this is nasty. And she's like, what? I'm like, this is gross. This is gross. She's like, but you can taste. And I just like, oh my gosh, I can taste again. And it tastes <laughs> horrible. <laughs> Well, I guess horrible is better than no taste at all. Yeah, that sounds like my idea of hell to not be able to taste food. <laughs> my my wife's uh my wife's grandma actually has completely lost her sense of taste, which is kind of weird. Um she's oh. still a very good cook, but all she can taste is lemon and salt. Oh wow. So is strange. That COVID related yep. or something else? No, no, no. This is permanent. It's been that way for I don't know, three or four years now. Oh wow. Yeah. Kind it's of just be... an interesting thing that can happen when you get older, I guess. Yeah, yeah. yeah I do have um, uh, one of my gym coaches that I've known for twelve years or more now. Yeah, he's uh, he he's always had that when he talks about you know trying to uh, uh, plan a, a diet for your calorie intake. I say, yeah, it's easy for you. You can't taste anything. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, how about you, Gwen? Anything exciting happen over the last weekend? 
Um, yeah, I mean, this weekend, uh, being uh, also self-isolating, I've spent a lot of time um, playing no map. Uh, a lot of that time was spent trying to recover bodies <laughs> from my group. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was a blast. It was uh, great fun. I'm really enjoying the no map experience so far. Any particular fun stories to share about uh, getting your body back? Oh um, my! Where to start? <laughs> our whole our group has been chaotic in all the best ways. Uh, only the most ridiculous things happen to us. Um, and uh, yeah, so this story of uh, of uh, losing our bodies. So we were we went iron mining um, quite far away from our main base. Uh, our main base being on the spawn spawn island. Um, and so on the, well, we, we went, we found some good swamps, mined a lot of, uh, uh, iron started smelting it over there. And then, uh, I had the great idea to try to sell half of it back to the main base so that we could start building and upgrading our base there and stuff. Uh, it was already quite late by that time. It was late in the evening. Um, but I was like, oh no, it's going to be fine. You know, we're all on a long boat. What can happen? We might get a little bit lost, but we know more or less like directionally looking at the sky and stuff where, where where to go to hit Spawn Island. So we went and sailed ahead and it was all fine and good. We were more or less in, you know, headed in the right direction. And then uh, when we got a bit closer, we we hit some, uh, it was I think nighttime or like evening or something. And we hit some uh, uh, really misty weather, really foggy. We really couldn't see anything. And, uh, so, so we were trying to find our way, see if we could see land. And then suddenly right in front of us, what do we see? A locks in the water. We're like, <laughs> oh crap, we're not ready for this. Go, go, go. And then like the person who was steering tried to steer away. And then we crashed into a tiny island, which had a second locks on it. And that is pretty much the last thing we saw before all dying. In one instant, we got completely wiped out. The boat was wrecked. Uh, all of us just one stomp of a locks and we were all dead. And yeah, it was uh, a bit disheartening. We were like, okay, well, now it's like 3 or 4 a.m. for us in Europe. We're, we're not going to try to recover our bodies now. We don't even know where we crashed. Um, and so since, so that happened, I can't remember, probably like on Thursday night or when either Wednesday or Friday night or something like that. The next two evenings of gameplay, cause I, I usually play in the evenings. Um, the next two full gameplays, we spent hours sailing hours. We, I actually, uh, recorded one of my, uh, the, the next kind of gameplay six hours we sailed everywhere we sailed oh, wow. in the general direction where we thought our bodies were we were like so determined to get our graves and our, our stuff and our iron back um looking for that island and we, we thought it was a tiny island of planes because it it looked really small so there was nowhere to escape uh when we hit the the, the rock um and so we were looking for basically two loxes with the graves around it on a tiny island and we sailed everywhere we had even at some point um two boats we had two calves and we had like a whole strategy with uh, our group split into on two boats every time we found an island instead of both going in the same direction we actually circled the island uh in in opposite directions so we could circle quicker and we would meet on the other side just to see if we could spot any well spot the graves and we did that for yeah for two long nights i think one of the one or two of the other teammates did that also like during their playtime uh while i was offline uh and after a while we were like okay we need to give up we need to just gear up again and just you know we'll find our graves at some point somewhere but let's stop searching and then um in the process we also found like a a, a poi a, a constructed um point of interest, uh, which we managed to uh, take. And then we built like a base on top of it. Um, and that POI was in the plains. It was like Yagla's fingers with a, um, uh, fueling village underneath, um, no artifacts or anything, but it was fun trying to take that. Uh, so we, we started building a base on top of that thing. And then yesterday, uh, <laughs> one of the, the, the people in our team said, we found our graves. The graves were, I kid you not, 50 meters away from that base that we were building. 
<laughs> they were oh. right there the whole time. <laughs> the only place we didn't look because we were like, well, that's there's no island there. It's not. It doesn't look like where we crashed. And we didn't even think that it was the area where we crashed. So the whole time we were sailing and looking for our bodies everywhere. And the the graves were just there in walking <laughs> distance the whole time. Oh, no. And <laughs> yeah, the funniest thing is uh, uh, Morning Darkness, one of uh, our, our players, uh, she was spending a lot of time of her time building up on the Yaglus Fingers. Uh, she was building the base there. And she said, oh yeah, I, I saw something over there because we're, we're all using the uh, colored sign mods. So whenever you have signs, it kind of the writing is like bright white. So it looks a bit like the writing on the graves or like how the graves glow. And she thought she was like, oh yeah, I saw something glow over there, but I thought it was someone put, uh, putting a sign saying to save, to not kill the loxes. So she didn't like really think twice about it. She didn't investigate. So she had even seen our graves <laughs> this whole time <laughs> when we were searching. Uh, yeah. Well, it's funny, uh, just for the listeners who don't know, the reason why she thought it was a sign that was glowing because uh, we we allow the um, mod that you can change the color of the signs so they're easier to read. So you get this bright, glowy text on them. And I'm guessing that's what she saw in the distance or thought yeah. she saw in the distance. Exactly. Well, please tell so, yeah. me that you uh, <laughs> recorded or streamed that so that we can check out some of that footage. I unfortunately I wasn't recording or streaming the day where we the crash happened. Um oh. I did I did record the full 6 hours of sailing um and uh, and then but I messed up the recording. I didn't record my own voice. I recorded everyone else's. Um <laughs> but I so after this recording, I'm jumping on with the crew. We're going to we found another POI with some I think it's the Night Sisters one. So it's one with uh bosses to take down and potentially artifacts. So we're going to do that as a team, but we're also going to go and kill the two loxes and recover our bodies as a team. And I will be streaming that. Oh, that sounds cool. Yeah, I love I love nice. uh, when you guys stream because then I can always go back and and check out all these adventures you're having. Sounds so much fun, especially on that no map server. Yeah, very fun. So for me, I've been super busy every day with the uh, making videos and. And doing server stuff and Discord admin stuff, but uh, did take a little break with the wife, and uh, we went uh, over to uh, Alameda here in the San Francisco Bay Area. It's a little island in the in the uh, Bay of uh, the San Francisco area. And we went to a huge antiques fair. It's on an old Al Alameda naval base, so the old runway that where the planes used to take off when the when the base uh, was operating. Uh, Fun fact: It's where MythBusters was filmed. Yes. Curious. There's also yes. a very good distillery there, St. George's. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I've actually worked with uh, uh, in in filmmaking and video video work. I've worked with some of the people involved with um, the MythBusters crew, um, and uh, I forget her name, but the uh, the redhead uh, who was on the show. Tori. No. Tori. The Tori. I think. Yeah. I'd have to double check, but. Uh, yeah, so we were out there, um, huge antiques fair, biggest like fair I've, I've ever been to because it's on, they take up most of the uh, airstrip. Um, and yes, uh, everything there is supposed to be at least 20 years old or older. Not everything is, but uh, that, there's a lot of really old stuff and, and some semi-old stuff. But we ended up getting, uh, my wife found some, some cool jewelry. Um, we also, uh, we... We are sort of doing this little collecting thing. We're always looking for little old animal statues, just like little ones, you know, that are like the size of a bowling ball or maybe a little bit bigger um, to put in our in our front and backyard. So we got lucky this time. I think we got two or three of them. Usually we only get one or we don't get any. Um, and then um, my, wa my wife found some cowboy boots. She, she loves her cowboy boots. And uh, I haven't had a pair in a long time, so I thought, ah, I'll pick up a pair. And not only did I find one, but I found two. So um, fun, fun stuff there. Uh, we need to yeah. see pictures of those uh, yeah. glorious cowboy boots. <laughs> well, yeah, I have to put on my cowboy shirt and my cowboy hat. <laughs> being so pale, <laughs> being being a ginger, I I, uh, I always, especially in the summer, I always have to wear like a wide brim hat and um, usually it's just uh, like one of those um, big sun hats but uh, you know, if I want to get a little more dressy, I'll wear my fancy cowboy hat. So at this antiques fair, you said everything had to be twenty years or older, right? 
that's the rule. Yeah. So did you see any original Xboxes? Because those are now 20 years old. Uh, you know, I don't look too much at the video games, except when, um, for me, what catches my eye is a, uh, I did see one Atari 2600 and some cartridges and uh, two or three original N- Nintendos and some cartridges. Um, and yeah, other places do have a lot of uh, games and other console systems, but I don't pay much attention to them because I didn't really play anything past Nintendo. Like once Nintendo came out, that was, you know, it's Atari 2600 Nintendo. And then I went to uh, PC games after that. And yeah, so they don't grab my attention, but I'm sure some of them were there. For some reason, the thing that I remember most about getting my first Xbox is the smell of it when I opened the box. <laughs> What did it smell it gave like? Me goosebumps. You, you know that like it's Plastic? kind of like a chemically plasticky smell that new electronics have. Yeah, it was like that, mm. but uh, I don't know. Maybe I, it was just a new thing for me that I was experiencing for the first time. But um, yeah, something about that smell always takes me back to the Xbox One. Or How old does that make you feel Xbox. that that was twenty years ago now? <laughs> Pretty crazy. <laughs> Um, and I, so I have a quick announcement. Uh, my season one survival and season one no map Valheim servers that launched over the last few weeks were so popular that I'm now launching a new hard mode version of the map, especially because on the survival server, um, players uh, did get through the content a little quicker than we had thought. So we are putting together a hard mode version to slow them down and give uh, players who didn't get a chance to experience all of the uh, cool points of interest and, and mini bosses um, a chance to do that. And because of the new hard mode stuff, uh, it's going to take a little more team effort, I think, than maybe they some of them did the first time around. But uh, it'll be exciting. Might If we have time, we'll talk about that later. Um, so yeah, so there's some Valheim news uh, coming up uh, or that has come out. And last week they mentioned uh, on their Twitter that they're doing a hashtag Valheim BOTM builds of the month. Basically, they'll um, honor um, or they'll show off builds of the month that they uh, like and and pick a winner. I I don't. Does anybody remember if they're doing prizes for that? I can't. I don't remember. But I know that they were going to feature them. I don't believe so. I think it's just a feature on their Twitter account. Yeah, yeah, that's fun. I I love seeing what all the uh, cool builds people uh, come up with. And then just today, before we started recording this podcast. They released um, uh, some, a fireside chat on YouTube, and uh, I'm always sleeping when they release that because you know they're in Sweden, I'm in California. I think it was around 4 a.m. for me when they released that, but uh, I got up and and made a video on it. And and so a couple of things in the fireside chat, they don't really point them out or talk about them. But uh, if you're paying attention, you can see a couple of new things in the video. Did anybody here have a chance to check out the fireside chat yet? I did this morning, yes. Some exciting Easter eggs. Yeah, what did you see? Well, first of all, they were sitting on top of a new rug, which is cool. It looks like a kind of rectangular style rug similar to the Lox one, uh, but it's kind of a dark, uh, dark gray burgundy color almost, um, which is kind of neat. And then in the background, kind of hiding behind some uh, some banners, was a new armor set, which looks pretty incredible. It's kind of rogue-like styling. Um, and uh, who knows, maybe it's uh, pulling from some new Fenring material. Um, that's kind of the, the, the vibe that I got from it. It's kind of like dark fur and scales and that type of thing. Um, so maybe kind of a side grade armor for, for the mountains that's going to come with the mountain caves. Yeah. That's what I was thinking too. Uh, the rug and the armor kind of seemed like they were made from a similar thing. So I'm wondering if Mm -hmm. we're going to get some kind of fen ring pelt or something to make, um, uh, that new armor or if there's, you know, some kind of mini boss or something in the cave. Uh, but yeah, yeah, my guess is it's fen ring armor. Yeah, I really hope so. It'll work very well with my Fenrir character that I run the roleplay events with. Yeah. I have a theory, too, that uh, so Fenrings are like the only mob that jump in the game. And so if it's going to have a set bonus, I'm going to guess that it's 
going to maybe have a little bonus to jumping or maybe like less fall damage or something. Uh, mm-hmm. That's just my theory. But also, because they revealed new Mistlands footage uh, on a boat. There's, you know, the character standing on a boat and the camera kind of spins around it. So you get to see a little bit more of the Mistlands. And then standing high up on the precipice that we saw from a, a still image uh, a while back, the camera spins around it. And so you get to really take in the environment and it looks to me like it's really dangerous, jagged, uh, terrain. Uh, and it looks like you're going to have to jump a lot because of like all the little steps in the rock and things. So I'm wondering if, you know, some new armor or maybe a new meat or something will help with fall damage or maybe boosting jumping a little bit. That's Mm -hmm. my theory, my working theory anyways. I love the spikes kind of driving up through the mist. It gives it a very apocalyptic vibe. And Grimcore talked about that in the fireside chat a little bit too, where it's kind of a unique or different uh, or special approach to biomes in Valheim, which is good to hear um, in comparison to, you know, what else is in the game. Uh, And it's really nice that it's bringing more verticality to the game. Like it's rivaling the mountains in terms of that verticality uh, because pretty much all of the other biomes are are quite flat, like even including Ashlands and deep North as well. So, um, you know, unless they completely overhaul those uh, it's nice to have a second biome with that level of verticality. So jumping would make sense. Um, I know it's a pain to, to jump your way up a mountain without a pickaxe. That's for sure. And uh, we are going to go on to another segment here. We're going to talk about our favorite things in Valheim. Rudy, do you want to take us down that path? I'd be happy to. So, yeah, one of our favorite segments here. What are our favorite things? Uh, So this week we're going to talk about armor. Uh, So what's everyone's favorite armor in the game? What do you wear uh, when you're battling? Or uh, what do you wear when you're just roaming around uh, running errands type things? So, uh, Start it off here. Uh, let's hear from you, Gwen. Me? Um, I would uh, probably say the troll uh, armor, or oh, at least the troll tunic, because I like the the nice guy. So I always go by aesthetics. If it doesn't look good, I'm not wearing it. So troll tunic, I like the blue. Uh, the troll leggings look cool as well. Um, they look like real clothes, and I enjoy wearing them. Um around when i need to go in battle though i will wear the uh wolf chest um the reason why i wear the wolf wolf chest and not the padded one is, and i do wear the padded grief so i've got like a frankenstein armor basically um i don't wear a wolf or locks cape uh because everyone else has one and i don't want to look like everyone else <laughs> um so i wear my linen cape fully upgraded and so for the um frost damage or frost resistance i would uh, that's why i've got the uh silver uh what's it called the wolf chest uh with the padded greaves the padded greaves look quite cool i like the the color and the style on them so they pass the test um and helmet i would say the uh drake helmet it looks cool it looks cute i like it with a little haunt yeah i think the drake helmet is awesome Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. definitely and what color of uh linen cape are you rocking uh, white, because I uh, don't feel like it's uh, uh, one that many people wear. And uh, sometimes when you get that bug where you're walking around and the, the, the cape is suddenly at, you know, in, in front, uh, it kind of looks like an apron, which okay. looks, you know, <laughs> good for an innkeeper. So yeah, <laughs> or giant bib, maybe. <laughs> oh, we need to ask the devs to make you an apron. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I want uh, a, a, an apron dress, like an actual Viking or Norse apron dress, which is what women y- used to wear, um, because they're they're beautiful. They call co- they're cool and they're held up by cool looking tortoise tortoise breeches, uh, which I would love to see in game as well. Um, and yeah, I hope that there will be more like just normal clothes options that are not necessarily armor for battle. Um, I feel like they're they're upping their design game with the root armor and some of the um, newer armors, like the one that we we saw a sneak peek of in the fireside chat. So hopefully more more different clothing options. And uh, yeah, I would love to see some stuff that is actually inspired by uh, Norse and and Viking clothes, things with really nice embroidery um, and uh, different uh, colors and and linens and stuff like that. So yeah, let's. Uh, Let's see. So for now, I'm rocking the uh, uh, tunic, the troll tunic and the padded greaves with my white cape. And uh, yeah, that's how I roll. 
even if the new stuff were not completely aesthetic, it'd be really cool if it came with some minor buffs. Like you have an apron that reduces your cooking time or uh, <laughs> building clothes that reduce your stamina usage when you're when you're building or gardening or something like that. It'd be pretty neat. I still want to see a feather cape that makes you not die when you fall, not take mm-hmm. fall damage. <laughs> <laughs> you also need a smoke keep that prevents smoke damage. Oh man, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so that that's your role play armor, but I think you should also share your superwoman armor. Oh yeah, yeah. So in the same spirit, <laughs> uh, when I my admin character um has pretty much the same outfit, maybe fully troll, but with the red cape, and uh, and yeah, I enjoy flying around with that admin character because it does look like a, a super girl <laughs> with a belt as well. And uh, Thorn, what about yourself? I know you're a big fan of one of the uh, the newer armors that was released in the game. Yeah, um, I I don't go changing my armor all that often, so I like something that's kind of a balance between movement and armor. Uh, and I generally lean towards the new root armor set. Um, I really love the earthy look. Uh, I wish we had a little bit more of that, where it kind of leads into the like druidic nature, natural, like mythical side of things. Um, I love how that feels and it pairs really well with the, uh, the locks cape, um, uh, and functionally the bow buff is awesome. You know, that's definitely the best set bonus in the game right now. Who, who knows what they're going to add with other side grade armor sets in the future. But, uh, in terms of helmets, um, I really like the Drake helmet, anything that has kind of like horns or some sort of objects like kind of coming up off the top of the head i usually think looks pretty cool so both the the root and the drake helmet are pretty neat and then if i'm just hanging around working uh just doing something casual around the base sometimes i'll rock the leather armor i I really like the simplicity of it um but it still feels kind of refined compared to wearing rags or something else yeah i was gonna say i do like the uh the leather and even the bronze helmet uh not helmet the leather and bronze uh, tunics they look quite good i like the detail um they do look like clothes again um Mm. i feel like the more later game stuff is so so bulky that you just look a bit weird walking around doing your everyday stuff in full kind of padded gob absolutely that's why uh when i'm running around and and doing errands or, or whatever uh, I'm usually in the the blue linen cape. That's the the color our clan likes to use is the blue. So I'm usually running around in the blue linen cape and padded greaves, and and that's it. I like to go shirtless, as uh, you may have seen in Jurok's videos when I'm running <laughs> around there. Um, but yeah, when when out on the resource server or grinding away, I usually go with the full padded to uh, to get that uh, the best armor coverage. But uh, Mostly you'll see me running around in shirtless with a blue cape. That's that's my luck. Uh, when it comes uh, close to Christmas time, I'll always have my Yule hat on as well. Uh, and then Jurok's answer, uh, we know uh, what he kind of looks like from his videos here, but why don't you tell uh, the viewers what that actually is, Jurok? Yeah, yeah. So I, I really love um, actually even the rags in the game because for, for me, every outfit has like a role-playing um, you know, use. And especially since I run so many events, I like to use the armor that, or clothing or rags or whatever it is uh, to fit the role playing. But but yeah, I, I changed. I used to wear the full padded uh, with my uh, Odin cape and cowl from being a beta tester, uh, but I switched it up uh, recently. Uh, so I still wear the uh, Odin uh, ca- uh, cape, the Odin cowl. Uh, and sometimes I wear the hood, although usually I like to have my, my uh, beautiful bald head showing. And uh, I switched to the wolf chest uh, because everybody wears padded. And I, I found out that uh, the cape sits underneath the furry white uh, uh, wolf uh, fur at the top on the shoulders of the wolf chest. Uh, so it looks really nice, the kind of the, the black uh, Odin cape going up into the wolf uh, fur uh, shoulder pieces there. So ah. I really, yeah, it looks really cool. So I that, I switched that. Yeah, it does. And um, yeah, you can see that in any of my my recent videos. That's what I'm wearing. But I also I like any of the leggings that are sort of skinned, like it's, they're they're just a texture over your standard legs, uh, because it's it's like it's more slimming. It doesn't look bulky, um, and the padded leggings look really nice. Uh, mm-hmm. So I've kept those. Um, I'm not as big a fan, um, of the, 
the leggings, like the wolf leggings that um, add that extra bulk to your legs. Um, for a role-playing situation, it's fine, but just um, uh, my standard look, I uh, I wanted something that looked a little more slimming. <laughs> Yeah, the, you, it's funny that you say that because exactly the same as uh, as me, and th that's exactly why I use the wolf chest with the white cape because the white fur at the top blends into the cape and it gives it a unique look. So yeah, definitely uh, on the same uh, wavelength there. And also, I agree with you. The uh, the um, slimmer leggings look look a bit better. Um, that I think what they did with the wolf one. The reason why they're so bulky is I think it is inspired by some of the um, actual Viking um, uh, outfits or, or uh, trousers that they find found. I think it's um, probably in, in some parts of Scandinavia or maybe more towards like um, the eastern side where uh, they have found um, Viking trousers like that that kind of bulk out. Then kind of like MC Hammer Pants. Um, but Viking. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think they were kind Parachute of emulating pants. that look. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I think they were uh, emulating that look, but I don't know, uh, that plus the really bulky kind of top armor, it just looks too much. It just looks like you're wrapped into like a, in, in a, some bubble wrap or something. <laughs> and just to take a quick break from the show, I wanted to mention that I am now an ambassador for the Grim Frost. Remember that company that supplied the prizes for the Valheim Build for Balder competition? Yep, it's the same one. They have thousands of amazing modern and historical Viking products from clothing to armor and weapons, drinking horns, figurines, replicas made from real Viking artifact finds, all kinds of amazing stuff. Use my link grimfrost.com slash question mark the letter a f f equals 310 again grimfrost.com slash question mark a f f equals 310 now back to the show so we're going to talk about some of the things that we would like to see maybe changed in the game if there was a magic button of course we appreciate all the efforts and everything that the devs do and whatever they work on their vision has been absolutely amazing uh, but if we had a magic button that could change something in the game uh, one of the things that uh, I would do uh, is, so the interface itself, it's simple and it's elegant, and I, I just absolutely love that. Uh, but some of the ways that we interact with it could be slightly improved upon. And one of the things is, I wish that we had an easier way to split stacks. So right now, you can pick up a whole stack, or you can um, split it into two, or you have to grab a slider and drag it. And if you have a really large stack of something, say like gold or something, you know, coins, uh, trying to get to the exact number on that little slider can be very tedious or if not impossible at times. So you have to split the stack and then split it again so you can land the slider. What, what I wish they would do is just a simple fix. It's what most games, or at least like when I played Seven Days to Die for years and years, when you pick up a stack, there was a uh, when you clicked uh, into another slot, it would just drop one piece from that stack. Because a lot of times that's all you want. You want to grab one piece or two pieces, and you could just quickly grab it. And and especially like when I'm handing out stuff to players on the server, I I get a stack of this stuff, and I want to give one to each player. Well, I have to go in. I have to drag the slider to one, and then you know it, when you count the clicks, I think it was something like seven clicks. And, and or mouse movements to get to one stack. When when in like Seven Days to Die or other games, it would be two clicks. You pick it up and you click and then you have one there. But in Valheim, you got to do it with like seven clicks and or mouse movements. So it's it's a little tedious, I would just love. And, or and just give me a little box so I can t type in the exact number of the items that I want to split the stack into. Most games have that too when you're splitting a stack. But uh, that's mine. Anybody uh, feel the same about uh, splitting stacks? Yeah, it's pretty finicky. Yeah. I actually just learned a shout out to Hjalrak here, my commander uh, in BSC. I literally just learned last week that if you hold control down and then hit the items that they automatically move over, I drag and dropped items up until last <laughs> week. I just learned about that. And holy smokes. That's so cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's definitely a big uh, one I'm glad is in the game. Uh, Thorne, what about you? Anything that you would push the button to change? 
This isn't necessarily something within the game, but uh, just kind of something about uh, Iron Gate's uh, approach to community engagement and that kind of thing. So, like, I love the game as it is, and I really appreciate the devs taking the time to do things right and, you know, iterate on their ideas and, um, you know, holding off on shipping things until they feel like it's in the right place. And I think they've done a great job of that uh, up to this point. And sometimes that causes things to be a little bit delayed, and I think that's okay, and it's it's the right choice for the game. But um, I do wish they could consider how things are shared with the community a little bit better. Um, I think, you know, it's it's quite common for uh, the Iron Gate devs to kind of casually talk about updates that are going into testing and that kind of thing um, when they're, you know, joining a content creator's channel or something like that. And that's, that's all in good. I, I love when we have, you know, uh, Iron Gate folks... Um, either on the podcast or joining for our server events and and sharing little tidbits of information with us. But that really should be something that gets shared, uh, you know, as a Steam post update or a blog post or something like that. Uh, you know, with the Mountain Caves update recently, there there was a lot of casual talk, like in an obscure channel on the Valheim Discord uh, about updates that were going to testing and then being pulled. And um, none of that got announced officially and... Roadmap wise, uh, I know with the kind of iterative approach that the devs are taking, uh, it's hard to get a roadmap out, but um, they did originally release a kind of slightly overly ambitious roadmap that they ended up rescinding, um, you know, sometime last year. Uh, but I would love to see like an updated roadmap, even if it didn't have specific dates on it um, or anything like that. It would be nice to uh, to kind of have that engagement with the community so we at least have a little bit more of an idea of what's coming beyond, you know, two, three months out. Uh, they definitely have the cash to improve it with, uh, with the large influx of players and everything. So yeah, just, uh, not necessarily a criticism, just some feedback for the team that we'd love to see a little bit more engagement, um, maybe, uh, kind of across the whole community and less so on the one, well, not less so on the one-to-one forums, but in addition to, but yeah, I know that they're, um, were overwhelmed when they had got such a large community, you know, early on and had to uh, deal with the huge influx to their discord channel and all the people asking questions. And uh, they even in this fireside chat, uh, Richard talked about, uh, you know, having plans for the game, but then in the first three months of having millions of people play it, um, all of the uh, bug reports and things that came out that they you know could never have tested without such a large player base. Uh, it changed a lot of their plans and they're you know they're still they're, they're a small team and I remember him saying that uh, in, in in the fireside chat just this morning that he's grown the team a little bit because they started off with just three of them, him Grimcore and his uh, other partner that he started the business with. So they're it seems like they're tr- they're figuring it out as they go, which actually I love to see because I feel it's sort of the same thing that I've been doing with my YouTube channel and uh my gaming servers and a Discord community. Yeah, there's always things that you could do better um in hindsight, but you're kind of figuring it out as a go and and yeah, p- feedback like yours is great like like they should hear that and and that you know can help maybe influence things in the future. But he did say something really interesting. He said something like growing the team. I think they have like eleven or twelve people now. Growing the team meant that he had to manage more and work less on the game. Uh, it's still work, but it's managing the team, and it took away time that he wanted to work on the game. So that's that's really interesting, and it's just, that just kind of like falls into like your suggestion. It's like he'd rather be working on the game and not dealing with like uh, you know the other things that need dealing with like community engagement and you know managing a team. But you know he also pointed you know pointed out the pros and cons to it. Like the pros were that he has more people now and they can work on separate things like like the abomination and the, ar- the root armor or the mountain updates. And while you know the other half of the team is working on um, the new Mislands biome update you know, when they finally get to release. So, um, Mm. yeah, feedback is great. And I think they're doing a wonderful job and, and learning as they go as, uh, I think, uh, a lot of us are. Yeah. Yeah. Totally agree. Uh, Gwen, what would you change with a magic button? Um, 
So I enjoy building in this game. I'm not the strongest uh, builder compared to some others like Thorin, who are uh, just uh, born with an uh, innate uh, <laughs> uh, uh, with ability hands. to build incredible things. Um, but I... Yeah, so I enjoy I enjoy building. I really enjoyed the Hearth and Home update. It gave us so many um so many great new uh build pieces that we can get really creative with. There is one thing though that I just cannot do in this game is building roofs. It just <laughs> it just drives me nuts. I don't know what it is, but trying to clip roofs, especially if you're doing something that is not just a a, a rectangular shaped um building it it just drives me mad i can't it, the things don't clip properly i have to always uh, try to find the weirdest angles go build ladder upon ladder upon ladder to get on top of the thing to try to clip the thing in the right place it just it's really finicky and i i don't know why it's just with the roofs with the all the other build pieces no problem at all but i don't know am i the only one having this problem Oh, roofs are my kryptonite. I, I, I will start a build, and as soon as it comes to the roof, I'll call uh, someone else to come help me because I just, I'm the same boat. I cannot figure it out. Right. Yeah, I think Thorin, as long as... tell us the secrets. Uh, <laughs> How do we do roofs? <laughs> as long as you're uh, building within the kind of delivered angles that they give you, it's not too bad. Like if you're building, you know, at... Uh, if you're building angled sloped roofs and then you're building, you know, 90 degrees to that perpendicular, uh, everything usually works pretty well with like the I and the O corner roof pieces. You can usually get those to clip nicely. It's when you start to have like off angle roofs combined or you try to do a round roof or anything like that, it can get really finicky. Um, Mm. I don't know if there's a way to make the snapping easier when you're getting into weird angles like that, but one... A uh, solution that I would love to see is either having triangular roof pieces or one by, uh, probably yes. preferably is one by one roof pieces instead yes. of two by two or in addition to um, just for those like awkward areas where you're just trying to kind of fill a space. And if you use a big two by two square, the top corners end up like clipping out the yeah. the sides on either side. Yeah, it's it's super frustrating. So um, would love to see that there. There aren't a lot of good solutions right now. I think you end up just trying to like cover it up with beams and ornamentation and that type of thing whenever things mm. are clipping weirdly. Just hide the mess under the <laughs> under nice yeah, exactly. pretty beams. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the smaller roof pieces is something that I've suggested uh, to Grimcore. I think when when he had come on to the server uh, one time, uh, but mm. Rudy, magic button to change something. What would it be? Uh, well, before I give mine here, uh, I was thinking of uh, one of the episodes we had a few weeks back. Uh, Gwen was talking about the uh, item stands and seeing where that little peg is to put it on. Uh, yes. and, and we saw that tweet from Jonathan, uh, that little gif he had of those arrows. So uh, I think they might be listening to these podcasts and taking <laughs> our uh, suggestions mm-hmm. to heart because it looks like your uh one of your things was changed there. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, I'm so thankful. I think I literally on the Discord, because uh, some of the devs are, are on Discord, I, I tagged them, said that I was uh, very, very happy about this. And a couple of people jumped in. Uh, yeah, it was really nice to see that. Um, yeah, that was taken into account. Us uh, decorators are very, very happy about that uh, change when it gets implemented. Absolutely. Yeah, as a fellow decorator, I'm very excited for that. Um, but one thing I noticed in the last few weeks, uh, when you, especially on a multiplayer server like ours, where we have, uh, you know, 30, 40 people on at one time, sometimes when you're crafting something or cooking something in that bottom right corner, when someone logs into the game or even chats in the game, it covers up the crafting button, right? So when I'm trying to make, you know, five stacks of ice creams, I have to, and someone logs on, you have to actually wait until that prompt kind of goes away and you can continue crafting. Uh, So that was something I thought of last week that uh, if there was some way to change that, maybe, I I don't know, move the crafting button or or the chat to a different area. Uh, I don't know what your guys' thoughts are, but it it can take you a while to to finish crafting a bunch of stuff if people are constantly uh, logging on or chatting in the game, right? 
Yeah, try yeah. filming a video when two people are shouting I was just at each other say back and that, forth. <laughs> Thorin, oh my god, when I try to record a video on the server and we've got 20 players on the server and they're talking to each other, it's just constant chat in the bottom right hand corner, right? Like interrupting the video, even when you turn the interface off, it doesn't shut off that chat window. Why doesn't it shut off the chat window? I don't understand. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, even if you had a toggle to just like hide the chat window completely or something like that, whether it's independent of the the rest of the interface toggle or not, uh, yeah, I don't know, but it would be nice to have a fix for that. Yeah, so I wanted to move on to talking quickly about our server and um, some of the things going on in our servers. So we've got five servers now, a sixth one launching, which is the hard mode season one. But uh, Gwen told us uh, a fantastic story at the beginning about playing on the no map, but uh, you're the only one of us here who's playing on it. Can you just tell us what the general vibe of the no map uh, squad, uh, the people who chose to play no map, like, you know, uh, what is it like playing no map and working it's, together with people? Yeah, it's amazing. I'm really enjoying it. I going into that. I my main reason to join was I wanted to challenge myself a bit. I don't feel like I'd taken off risks playing this game. I'm like, I'm very slow at progressing and, and that sort of stuff. But I really wanted to try something new, see the game in a new light and, uh, and yeah, just challenge myself with something that I'm not even good at in real life. Um, just finding my way without Google Maps is, uh, <laughs> is a challenge uh, in real life. And I thought in the game, it must be even harder because you only literally have the sun and the the Yggdrasil tree in in the sky to guide you. There's a few other uh, little tricks uh, to have like a portable compasses and stuff like that, which I, I can talk to uh, talk about in a second. But uh, generally, it's been really fun. I think everyone who joined this was in the same mindset of they wanted to try something different, challenge themselves, but also work as a team and help each other along the way. So um, there's, I think, about 30 people um, on that server, uh, or at least who joined that server. I think that probably about 20 that are still uh, pr very active on it. Um, split in small groups, I would say, probably groups of between like three and, and eight people. Um, and, and yeah, so far it's been really good. Uh, some of the players on that no map server has been, have been really helpful and in, in sharing tips, sharing, um, uh, some strategies and some, uh, good kind of guidance and, uh, helpful tips. So it, to, for, to the rest of the community so that we could all, um, use those. And, um, and yeah, and generally the, the vibe on the server itself is, uh, all the different groups have their little bases, but we've connected everything with roads. We're using roads. We're using signs a lot, uh, pointing in directions. Um, some of the players are building compasses in game, um, in, uh, in key areas or in every new Island that they discover, there's uh, waypoints when you're sailing as well. Uh, so it's, it's really cool in that way to find other ways to, um, discover and explore the world and still find your way back. Um, but what I, I think I'm, what I'm enjo enjoying the most is just, it's a really a next level of immersion. The fact that you you can still teleport, but the fact that you can't see the map and you can't see where you're going, you're so much aware of your, much more aware of your surroundings, and you're really paying a lot more attention to uh, where you're going, to where you've come from, to all the different details, the different um, aspects of the landscape that you can use to recognize and and memorize uh, to find your way uh, back, and it just brings a lot more. Yeah, it's a lot more immersive in that sense. Um, and I've really enjoyed that. Even just, you know, running around exploring an island with with a couple of other people, you have to keep an eye on the others, make sure that you don't lose sight, because if you do, then, you well, you might get lost. So, uh, yeah, it's just, it really feels like being even more in the game, just playing with other people, because I feel like... Um, when we're playing with a map, it's too easy to just go, you know, running in one direction and then you just check the map. Oh yeah, you're over there. Let me kind of get back your way. When you're not, you don't have a map, you, you have to stick together more or you have to find other ways to direct people. And I don't know, it's a, uh, it's very fun. I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying that challenge. Yeah. When I log onto the server's admin and I just kind of go around to see what the world looks like, it's really interesting to me to see the world. It feels more lived in. Because as I'm going around, instead of just 
the you know pristine um, terrain. Maybe you'll see you know in the past you'd see uh, trees cut or a big hole where a copper monode was mined, but otherwise you'd really no sign that there was there were ever any people here. But on the no map server, everybody makes roads everywhere, and at at the crossroads where, where they meet up, you know signs and. I don't know. It just it's it it just it puts a smile on my face to like know that the world it, it, it looks lived in. And if you're out wandering around and you came you came across the road, that's how I found as admin uh, some of the people's bases. Is I just flew around because I wanted to see what people were doing. Found roads, followed them, and then found their bases. It's just so much fun to see that the world feels lived in like that. Yeah, and it's uh, as a player uh, being able to <laughs> to just direct people uh, to your base by saying, "Yeah, take the road like that way, and then go left and like follow this sign." It's it just feels like real life. It's amazing. It's great. It's a uh, a lot more fun than just pinging on the map and like have the person find their way um, by other means. But yeah, no, I, I, it does feel a lot more. Yeah, as you say, lived in the base as well. Um, because you have to be so much more aware of your surroundings, you it, when you come back to your base, it feels like you're really coming home because not only there's always that slight sense of um, uh, you know the, the the sense of adventure when you leave because you're you're not sure that you're actually going to find your way back to your base. So you, there's al- always that slight. Uh, uh, concern that you might not find your way back. So when you come back to your base, you're even more happier to see your base because you're like, yeah, made it back. Um, but also the, because you tend to explore a lot more around your base or any place you go to really spot the different, um, uh, landscapes and, um, waypoints and things like that. I feel like you are a lot more in control of the area where you hang out, um, more so than when you're not using the map and you just like go from point A to B. Oh, sorry. When you're using the map, you just go from point A to B um, uh, because you've already marked those spots or, yeah. 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 I think uh, no map has been so popular that uh, every season will probably release a no map version if if people want, but I'm I'm guessing that they're going to want it now after doing it. Yeah. I believe... uh there was some talk in our Discord today about um, about the stars in the sky, that they're not just randomly placed. There's a reason that some of the stars are where they are. So it's kind of exciting to see what the no map crew is going to be able to figure out with that as well. Exactly. Okay, we're going to talk about some interesting facts about us. A little treat for hanging out to the end of the podcast. R- Rudy, what interesting fact do you want to share with us? Well, uh, a few weeks ago, we talked about what we're doing for summer and all that. And I said some some camping trips and, and some vacationing. I've always been huge into Sasquatch. I live in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. Um, so I'm really hoping this summer that I can get out and uh, tr- try and have an encounter. I've never had an encounter. I'm, I'm a full believer. I believe Sasquatch is out there, uh, not just from evidence provided, but from uh, Native American lore and, and stories that, uh, you know, these Native American communities have been saying for centuries. Uh, so I'm a huge Sasquatch guy, and I'm really hoping I can have some kind of encounter uh, this summer when I do some camping trips. <laughs> do, do they have uh, those little... Um gift shops on the side of the road with all the uh, Sasquatch and Bigfoot um, souvenirs and t-shirts and stuff uh, out there anywhere? Yeah, there's a few places. Uh, one of the big uh, hot spots for uh, Sasquatch activity is Radium, BC. Uh, and there's some nice um, hot springs there as well. So I'm hoping to do a little, uh, you know, hot springing with the family, but at the same time going out and, and seeing if I can, you know, get some get some calls back or, you know, to see one would be really cool. But uh, yeah, definitely uh, get some uh, Sasquatch merch. I'll even send some down to you there. I know you're in a good area for it too, actually, but uh yeah, that's something about me that uh, many people don't really know about and I don't always put out there because some people think I'm a little kooky, but uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what well, is a little kooky, uh, but it's fun. I, I love mythologies. They're they're fun. They're so much fun. They they play into my love of, of storytelling and, you know, passed down throughout the years. Uh, so favorite uh, Sasquatch, Bigfoot, uh, Abominable Snowman. Go. What? What is it, Rudy? In in any kind of like uh, 
uh, media, uh, TV show, movie, uh, anything that's popular? Do you have one in mind that you like? Because yeah, I have I two. Just say, uh, I would say our regular Sasquatch or Masquatch, as uh, the Native American communities call it in that area. Um, yeah, the, but nothing big, from pop culture that you can think of. The, the Jack Lynx, uh, beef jerky mascot. He's he, that's a good looking one. Very ana- anatomically correct, if if I do say so myself. <laughs> <laughs> I was, so I was going to point out too. One I was going to say, um, uh, the Wampa from Star Wars, which is like an <laughs> abominable, um, abominable snowman. Uh, and uh, my other favorite one, and I'm dating myself here is the Bionic Man episodes with the uh, Bigfoot, <laughs> the Bionic Bigfoot, if anybody's ever <laughs> seen that. If you haven't, look it up. It's it's totally fascinating. <laughs> I'm trying to remember what it was called, but it was an old Windows game where you like downhill skied down a hill and you dodged trees and you, had, you were getting chased by an abominable snowman. Uh, and if he caught you, you lost... That's one of my favorites. That rings a bell weirdly. I think it way, way deep in my memory. It's somewhere in there. <laughs> Is it called Ski Free? Uh, let me look it up and see. Uh, it says right here, almost everyone who had a Windows PC in the 1990s played yes. Ski Free. <laughs> yeah, it was great. 91 oh, wow. through 95. Yeah. Yeah. It's a funny little uh, picture of the uh, <laughs> pixel art of the uh, abominable snowman. Well, Thorid, uh, what about you? Um, interesting fact with, about you that you want to share? Uh, yeah. Um, looking around my office, I have a somewhat large Lego collection. I'm a bit of an addict. Uh, usually <laughs> buy a, a set or two a year and then usually get one for my birthday, which is fun. So uh, yeah, I've got lots of different stuff from Star Wars to NASA things to James Bond cars and all you can really think of, which is cool. I've got two giant bins of unassembled Lego uh, to pull from if I ever want to fool around with it. And then um, another fun fact, uh, with my work, we have like a um, an activity, like health benefit, uh, where you get a certain amount, a certain dollar amount where you can expense towards, uh, you know, healthy activities. And they just added a whole bunch of like mental wellness stuff to that. So now I can buy and expense a certain amount of Lego every year for my mental <laughs> really? well-being. Oh, wow. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Now, I got to say, having friends or family that are into Lego like yourself is makes gift giving so easy. Like you yes. just go <laughs> to toys, any toy store and pick a Lego set and they're usually ecstatic. So that's awesome. Yeah, I've always I grew up on Legos and I, I even have a, a, a bin of Legos. I don't get to play with it as much unless uh, my friends bring their kids over. Then I dump them out on the floor and uh, they think that I'm like dumping it out to sort of like, here you go, babysit yourself with these Legos so you don't bother us adults. Nope. I sit down right there on the floor and start playing with them. And they're always yep, surprised. <laughs> <laughs> I found I was more into, uh, remember Connects? The Connects, I was into more than uh, than Lego I found for myself. Yeah, I did yeah, like I all the other too. little toy pieces that connected together in various ways and like the advanced Lego sets too, the ones that had motors on them eventually, but yeah. Lincoln logs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As a kid, I was doing the old school Lego, the ones where you just get the pieces. It's not a set. You just have like a big box of all the different sized pieces. And I built houses. Mm-hmm. Yep. Is that why Thorin's such a good builder is because yeah. you, the Lego? <laughs> Could be. I bet. I bet. <laughs> Well, Gwen, what about you? Is there an interesting fact you'd like to share this week? Um, well, since we we you hinted at Star Wars, and we found out when was it two weeks ago, we uh, actually shared uh, our, our mutual collections of Star Wars stuff. Um, I think we, a lot of us share that common uh, common interest. I'm a bit of a Star Wars nerd, um, and uh, and yeah, I have uh, I don't have Star Wars Lego. I I haven't played Lego in a long time. Maybe I should. Maybe I should uh, try it out again. Um, but I do have a few Star Wars themed things in uh, uh, in my house. So yeah, it makes me wonder about the Lego thing. If there are groups where adults get together, and you know, like you know, people who are interested in Viking culture or whatever their their thing is, and they get together and make stuff or, and play dress up or whatever. I wonder if there's a group that gets together 
and just build and some Lego, Lego stuff together. <laughs> that would be awesome. Well, <laughs> if it doesn't exist, we should start it. Yeah, we should. I'll, I'll fly over to the US. <laughs> or maybe we should go to Canada because Thorin seems to have the great collection. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Come visit. <laughs> so, so yeah, interesting fact about me. I, I can't remember if I've mentioned it before, but uh, I've been playing table tennis or some people call it ping pong uh, ever since I was about eight years old or so. So I've been playing for more than 40 years and uh, the last probably 15 or more years, I uh, have uh, coached the sport a little bit, um, you know, uh, getting paid to, to coach it. I haven't done it in a few years. I tore my ACL uh, completely a few years back um, playing table tennis. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I coach the sport and I love playing it. It's like it's, it's one of the most um, interesting uh, physical activities. You, you're super exhausted, exhausting playing for two, three, four hours straight. And it's not like, you know, like the garage table tennis where you're standing at the end of the table and you're just bouncing it back. But uh, and not that I'm at Olympic level or anything like that, but yeah, I, I will be find myself, you know, 10, 15, 20 feet behind the table, you know, launching the ball back and running back and forth and chasing it. Uh, it's tons of fun. I love that sport, but I have to be careful. I don't want to re-tear my ACL or take mm -hmm. out my other one. <laughs> it's impressive. I, I really wanted a pool table when I was a kid and my parents got me a ping pong table instead. So I still, <laughs> I also have a soft spot for it. Aw. Cool. I'm a bit sad because in my town there was a um, a bar that had like ping pong tables that you could uh, go and rent for with your group for like an hour and play while drinking. Um, but that bar just uh, just closed uh, during the pandemic, so a bit sad. That was a fun activity. I'm uh, not good at all, but it was just very entertaining to see ping pong balls flying all over the place in people's cocktails <laughs> and stuff. Yeah, I've been at a few parties or 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 pubs or whatever where they have a table and my friends they get me a little inebriated and they then they try to win money off me thinking that I'm too buzzed to play and <laughs> are surprised that you know at my level of play and them not being as inebriated as me they they still can't eat, keep up at all <laughs> it's one of those things you know they say the 10,000 hours to master something i have way more than that in table tennis <laughs> <laughs> What do you prefer it being called, table tennis or ping pong? Um, well, because uh, the culture that I'm in, it's it's just always referred to that uh, where I'm at. So I just get in the habit of calling it that. But it, do it doesn't bother me either way. It's actually there's a like one of the board game manufacturers owns the uh, I believe the trademark on on the term ping pong, and it's meant to be mm. that little a little game. It's I think it's like two or three feet wide table. And little tiny nets and little tiny paddles and, and ping pong balls. Um, that's actually like the official ping pong. Uh, but it, of course, that is just a, a miniaturized version of table tennis and people carry the name over. But yeah. Oh, um, interesting. So kind of like Q-tips and Kleenex and all mm -hmm. that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's a brand name out there. And of course, because I play table tennis so well, uh, Everybody, you know, I've been called Forrest Gump a lot because of <laughs> Forrest Gump popularizing the sport here in the U.S. It's not nearly as big in the U.S. as uh, it is uh, in Europe and Asia. Yeah, I actually, uh, the last uh, Summer Olympics there in Tokyo, I actually watched some of that. And holy smokes, man, those guys can go. Oh, yeah. And I've yeah, played with, with uh, some of those players uh, at, at those levels because in, here in, in California, Bay Area, we have uh, some, some really high... Uh, level uh table tennis players and i can keep up a little bit <laughs> but uh, yeah no that's that's a totally that's like that's like me playing somebody who's a garage player them playing me <laughs> i'm the garage player to them but <laughs> well i think that's gonna do it for this week thanks for joining me everyone yeah thank you again for see having you next us. week yeah thanks for having us catch you next time and that's it for now have fun out there Thank you for listening to Podheim, Jirox Valheim podcast. We have new episodes coming out every Friday. And if you enjoyed listening, please support us by subscribing to the podcast on your favorite platform and leave us a rating and a review to help more Vikings find us. We also have a Patreon with perks for supporters like behind the scenes discussions, exclusive content and segments that are edited out of the main podcast and access to our Valheim gaming servers. 
If you'd like to play on our Valheim servers, join our Discord. The link will be in the description of this episode, along with the Patreon link. There, you will find all the information you need to apply to our gaming servers. Thank you to Gwen the Shield Maiden, Rudistic the Guardian, and Thorin, aka Metarune, for being part of this show. I'd like to give a huge shout out to my supporters, some of them on Patreon, the YouTube membership, and the ones who help boost our Discord server. Your support means the world to me and inspires me to make more videos, as well as run a community Discord and multiple Valheim gaming servers. If you enjoy my videos and would like to support my work, join our friendly Discord community and Valheim servers, links can be found in the description below. Skull! Have you ever tried to switch to your handler? Your handler? Your handler. <laughs> <laughs> handler.